let me first thank you uh, stefan uh, to organize this and it's very very useful to have such a uh, webinar where we share our knowledge and it's, it becomes as you said more important in, in these times uh, when we can't do a lot of stuff so it is very very important to keep updating uh, and th with technology especially it, it's best to keep updated and, and know what what's going around so Thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, represent our knowledge. So a bit about InstaCluster, uh, our organization and what we do uh, just in five minutes. So we uh, are one stop shop for 100% open source technologies. Uh, we, we deal with everything open source. So we have uh, broadly three categories in which we operate, uh, managed platform support and consulting. So managed platform is we host uh, the complete technology and you can use it as uh, as a service and we take care of all the operations uh, specifically about these technologies for support we just provide support for the technologies that you are hosting uh, in your organization and consulting we uh, just provide some consultation regarding the technology uh, and how to migrate to open source and these are some of the examples but we operate with uh, the, these four technologies broadly uh, in all these areas. So consulting, so we basically, me, Christoph, and today's presenters come from, from the consulting team. Uh, we have this uh, complete uh, roadmap where we strategize, architect, uh, develop, implement, train, support, and uh, manage. Uh, that, that ultimately leads to our managed service. And we have a lot of offering that that to make your life easy with those specific technologies as listed here. So we what what makes us different is, is we have deep expertise because we concentrate on specific set of technologies. We offer on-site offshore and remote consulting, uh, thought leadership because we ha we are actually involved in uh, developing and maintaining the open source technologies uh, that gives us thought leadership we have wide technology expertise not only in consulting group but across our organization and there are some unique differentiator that uh, backing up uh, our support team makes us very very unique and we have seen it all as in we we run our managed service uh, thousands and thousands of clusters uh, and nodes which uh, host these technologies that that makes us very very unique uh, we have global presence uh, insta cluster was founded in 2012 currently we have 100 plus employees in three regions uh, our headquarters is in redwood city usa exactly it's located in in the bay area san francisco uh, 24 we have 24 by 7 global support capability uh, for our managed service and support and we have 100 plus plus customers which are globally spread so we you can say we are a true global organization uh, some of our highlighting customers are uh, they are of course from various areas of business retail media finance technology and internet of things uh, as suited by and you can imagine all these companies generate a lot of data and they need a lot of processing power plus a lot of operations to maintain that data and we uh, provide that uh, some of some of the familiar names like Atlassian, IBM, uh, and yeah. So today's instructors. Uh, so first of all, Anup, that's me. I'm going to take care of Kafka section today. I deal with Cassandra, Kafka, uh, and other technologies. I generally involved in Kafka consulting projects. This is my email address if you want to reach me. Uh, Musa is going to join us later to cover the Elasticsearch part. He takes care of majority Elasticsearch, Kafka, and Java development, DevOps, uh, Cloud, etc. Uh, he has developed our Elasticsearch offering, so he is our Elasticsearch expert. And he's, yeah, as I said, mostly involved in Elasticsearch consulting projects. Uh, and Christoph is uh, our VP of consulting. He takes care of uh, technologically Cassandra and the rest of the technologies as well. Uh, and he is involved in all the consulting projects that we uh, handle. It's his email address. 
so yeah uh, talking a bit more about insta cluster as i said we have managed service enterprise support for for these technologies uh, consulting and open source contribution so those those makes us like like the main four pillars of our, our core business uh any questions around anything that we have covered in introduction or or about agenda or <clears throat> any any other stuff that we can i can or stefan can answer uh, uh I, I don't have a view on the question channel anymore so anoop if you or, or stefan if you guys see some questions um just interrupt me and then i will have a look sure welcome <laughs> so it's an introduction about cassandra to start with uh, it's to give you a very high level of a view of, of what is this technology. Uh, and we're going to cover a bunch of topics, uh, starting with how Cassandra was born. Uh, very importantly, the, the benefits of Cassandra. And here you can see that there are three benefits, three reasons why Cassandra has been developed. Uh, it's to provide high availability, which you would not have typically with traditional uh, you know, SQL systems. Uh, it's to provide very low latency, uh, a few milliseconds latency for your reads and your writes. And uh, there is no magic, of course, to be able to achieve this kind of latency. You need to make some compromise. And um, you will not be able to do joins, for example, because uh, you know joins on distributed system is just <laughs> impossible to do it fast. So Cassandra compromise. Uh, what can be done fast to only focus on, on what can be done in a few milliseconds. And the, the third benefit is linear scalability, uh, something very desirable for a lot of startups that want to become the next Uber, or you know, for, for the like of Netflix and Apple. The idea is that you start with a small workload for your customer base, and as, as you grow, and hopefully very quickly, you just add more nodes with uh, linear scalability to be able to handle the throughput, uh, the extra throughput. <laughs> so this is a promise of Cassandra. We're going to discuss that. Um, then we're going to have a bit of a look about what really is Cassandra under the hood. Uh, essentially, it's just a distributed hash table at its core, at its core base. And uh, a quick view of the pros and the cons of Cassandra. Uh, and then we're going to place Cassandra into the context of the famous CAP theorem, um, and a, a few use cases to discuss. I have more slides after that if we have time, so you know we will see where we go. Um, but very briefly, um, in the context of, of history, Cassandra was born uh, a bit late, and at the beginning you have those standalone and mainframe system that you would use to try to handle as much data as possible. Very expensive. Uh, I was very young, so I don't remember this time. Uh, but you know, uh, I got interested into networking computing myself with the system Oracle, SQL, uh, DB2 uh, when I was a young person. And at some point, it's become more and more difficult to handle uh, the volume of data in, in a single server. Uh, and that's when real time web and bit attached start to, to happen. <laughs> we needed a solution here. One solution is to pay a lot of money to get very expensive hardware. And that, that works up to a certain point. If you, if you have the use case, that, that's great. But if you just want to, start a start, to, <laughs> to launch a startup in the back of, of your garage, that, that's not possible, obviously. Um, so what happened is that in the mid 2000s, there was a bunch of papers that came out that tried to handle those problems with different paradigms. Uh, so Bitable, Dynamo, and, and Cassandra were three very influential uh, papers and technology <coughs> um, you know, to try to handle those problems with, with key value pairs and, and column stores, essentially. So Cassandra is kind of a mix between Bitable and Dynamo. It was developed and open source by Facebook. Thank you very much, Facebook. And it has been heavily adopted by a bunch of technology. Uh, the, the biggest one, obviously, is Apple. It used Cassandra with thousands of servers. It's just insane. Uh, Netflix, of course. Uh, not to store the, the video, obviously, but just to handle um, the information for the users and the preference and stuff like that. <coughs> Atlassian is a big user. They, you know, they're based in, in Australia. 
Uber is a big user, Spotify, uh, all those cool technology, but not only cool technology uh, firms. You also have large banks, uh, retail, uh, financial services, uh, IoT companies, all, all those large um, industry use quite often Cassandra. And why do they use that? It's because it provides very low latency, very high availability, always on. And you know, when you're Netflix or Uber you, or Apple <laughs> or anyone that is very serious about business, you need to be always on. And scalability. That's why they, they choose this technology. In some cases, it's, sometimes it's not the right fit, but when it's the right fit, it's, it's fantastic. <coughs> so that's what happened. Castle was born. Um, start to be used, um, get open sourced and used more and more by more projects. And then, uh, you know, it, it become an Apache project uh, with all the contributors to, to make it more and more stable and more and more usable. So Cassandra is one of those NoSQL system. Uh, you've heard, of course, of NoSQL already. <laughs> what does it mean? Uh, not SQL, not relational, not only SQL, just, just pick the one you prefer. Uh, all of them are kind of interchangeable. But it's a term to cover a bunch of database technology that um, cover use case that SQL would not be able to cover anymore. Um, and, and here's the key that one size does not fit all. That's why you have, uh, if you want a database and you search, you have thousands, hundreds of, of different options to choose from. And a lot of them are very serious. Uh, but you need to understand if it fits your use case or not, obviously. And why do we have so many options? Uh, it's because you need to be able to handle different kind of data size. You need to handle different kind of reliability that you expect and manageability. Maybe you want something simple. Maybe you want something that is not. Maybe you want something that has to be complex and is more difficult to manage. A distributed system, obviously. Maybe you want very high throughput. Uh, you might want flexibility or not on the data schema. You, you might want um, uh, to, handle, to handle graph uh, data, all this kind of stuff. So we will have different solutions. Uh, so of course, in Stack Cluster, we work with Cassandra, and we advocate for Cassandra. But we're also not stupid. Like Cassandra is, is not always the best solution. No SQL is not better than SQL. It's just different. It's about balancing the features and the flexibility that you want, essentially. And again, Cassandra, it's all about low latency, a few milliseconds, high availability, always on. Uh, even if some nodes crash, it's, it's, if you configure it correctly, it's still running. Even if, if a single data center crash, it, it might still be running if you make it uh, that way. And scalability. So this is just a copy paste from here, so from the internet, just a old classification of all the systems. You, you see, you have a lot of technology to choose from. Uh, Cassandra is, is uh, well, there is an arrow for you here. Um, so it's an OSQL system. It's, it's, it's sort of a key value store and sort of a mix with big table, something like that. Uh, but you have a lot of different options. Uh, some other classification that you might find. Um, yeah, it's just to give you a quick overview. In this case, it's, it's classified as a column store. Uh, in this case, it's classified as a key value store. <laughs> to be honest, it's, it's a bit of the two. <laughs> so that's why sometimes it's, uh, it's classified like that. Um, but let's have a closer look at Cassandra. OK, so so far it's quite very abstract. But now let's make it a bit more concrete. And essentially, you have a bunch of nodes. Uh, that are connected all together to provide a service, which is uh, writing and reading data. What is pre pretty cool with Cassandra uh, is that all the nodes are completely identical. They serve, they serve the same purpose. Uh, they achieve the same function. Um, there is no master node. Uh, there is no uh, data node uh, or reference node or ingestion node or this kind of stuff, which you have with other system. Elasticsearch, for example, you, you need some specialized node because it's a bit different. <laughs> but with Cassandra, it's very simple. All the nodes are the same. 
Uh, and you can scale. If you want more capacity, you just add more nodes, and you will have more disk usage that you can use. But you will also have a higher throughput. Um, so if, if these clusters can handle 10,000 requests per second, for example, uh, you, you double the node count, and you will be able to handle 20,000 requests per second. And that's assuming that you use it correctly, obviously. And there is a few gotcha. But if you do your data model correctly, if you configure it correctly, you will have this linear scalability. And what's cool is that, if, again, if you configure it correctly, even if you have a single node failure, and, and sometimes uh, multiple node failures, you will still have access to your, to your data. You can still read and write, which is pretty cool. So that's, again, something that I took from the internet somewhere. Um, it's uh, suspiciously very, very too much linear. But anyway, <laughs> essentially, it was just to demonstrate that Cassandra was uh, very uh, scalable uh, in a linear fashion. Um, so that was published, I think, by Netflix. Uh, <coughs> and that's what we observe, of course, uh, ourselves when we use Cassandra. Instacluster is a big user of Cassandra. We use it to store. Uh, all the monitoring data of our customers. So we experience this linearity. Uh, Cassandra is highly available. Here we have a quote, a quote from a uh, head of AdBrains, which is a big um, advertisement company. And essentially, there was this infamous hurricane Sandy in the US that completely destroyed uh, a data center. Uh, was was gone. but because our brand needed a very, very high level of availability. They use a multi data center configuration of Cassandra, which is built in. It's, it's a feature that is built in. And then they, they just keep using uh, another Cassandra data center and they just had no issue, uh, which is really amazing. So, of course, if you use a small cluster on, you know, for your small startup, well, you won't have multi DC. But if you're big, you will want multi DC. <coughs> uh, and here it's, it's a bad latency. Um, actually, this graph is a bit old, and latency that we achieve is much better than that. Uh, you have the median latency. You have then you have your percentiles. Uh, frankly, if, if you configure Cassandra very well uh, for your reads, you can have your 99.9 percentiles below uh, 50 milliseconds or even 20 milliseconds. Uh, and for your write, it's even better because write is, is cheaper with Cassandra. What's cool is that you don't need specialized hardware. Uh, you're obviously going to run that in the cloud uh, or maybe in your own data center if you have. Uh, running it on your laptop is very easy. Um, with Docker, it's even simpler. Uh, if, you are, if you want to have some fun, you can create a small Raspberry Pi cluster and, and run it on that, uh, just as a you know, uh, hackathon type of project, if you want. But yes, it just runs on every hardware. It's, it's very cheap. It's, it's very handy. So Cassandra, at its core, it's, it's, it's just a distributed hash table. And you all know that hash table is the fastest data structure that you can use. So it's a key value store. So key value store, hash table. Um, with a key, you will be able to hit the correct nodes. So not all nodes store your data, obviously. Um, here, we have a replication factor of three, which means that each piece of your data is going to be duplicated three times on three different nodes. So with this hash table approach, you know which node you're going to have to hit to do your read and your write. And then uh, very efficiently, you will have access to your data on disk, and you can return that to the clients. Um, there are a few pros and cons of Cassandra, uh, as is with every technology. The pro is that it's, it's highly available. Uh, we will see that a bit later. It's masterless, uh, which simplifies a lot of things. And you, know, you don't have this single point of failures, and you don't need to have the the hot and the cold uh, master and this kind of stuff. Linear scalability, both in terms of size, uh, of volume of data you can store, 
but also in terms of query per second you want to achieve. And that's very important. And low latency. However, in order to achieve that, you have to make some compromise. For example, you don't have joints. Uh, it's way too expensive. Uh, and it will, um, it will damage the performance of your cluster. Cassandra is done for a lot of incoming reads and writes all the time. And if you do some complex joins, not only it will be slow, but it's going to do a lot of I.O. and it's going to damage your latency. So joins are just not allowed. You can't do that. It also have poor secondary index support. And that's because secondary index in distributed system is very complex. Um, you have some secondary index with Cassandra. You can use them, but you have to use them mostly within what's called a partition. So, um, a bulk of data, if you want. Um, so typically, we don't really use them. Instead of using index, what we do is that we, we denormalize the data. And we duplicate the data in different manners to be able to query it in different ways. Um, and then you have restricted filtering. When you work with SQL, what you do is that you, you create a, a data model and then you create index and you, you have a lot of flexibility on the way you're going to query your data. Uh, with Cassandra, you will have to uh, provide the key all the time when you do a request and you won't be able to filter by other uh, columns. So because of you know, those pros and those cons, Cassandra is, is perfectly suited for OLTP. Online transaction uh, processing. Uh, Cassandra is fantastic as data ingestion. Uh, writes are very cheap. And very important for you guys, if you have one thing to remember about Cassandra, well, one of the five things, let's say, is that with Cassandra, you need to understand your request first. You need to understand how you're going to query your data. And then you can write your data model. And that's the other way around, obviously, uh, with SQL. So I'm probably going to repeat myself a bit here. Uh, but with traditional relational system, you build a beautiful data model. You create some index when you need. And you query it uh, with a lot of flexibility. With Cassandra, you typically need to understand how you want to query your data. <coughs> because it's a, it's a key value store, obviously. Um, and then you, you will have to do some denormalization if you want to have more flexibility. So you, you, you prepare to, do, to duplicate your data if you want, because the um, disk is cheap, essentially. So you're happy with duplication. Um, you come to joints. You have some limited support for aggregation. Uh, when you do a select star from blah, 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 the workload is, is very restricted. You need to provide the, the, the partition key, essentially. You don't have store procedures. You have what's called materialized view. Um, it has been released a while ago. A bit later, it has been marked as experimental. So essentially, you shouldn't use it. Hopefully, it will get better with Cassandra 4, which is meant to be released sometime this year, hopefully. You have very basic transaction support uh, using log batch and uh, lightweight transaction. Uh, and you don't really have relational integrity in the sense of traditional system. <coughs> so in terms of cap theorem, if you don't know, with a cap theorem, you need to balance three desirable properties, uh, which are consistency, uh, availability and, and partition tolerance. Consistency means that uh, when a client writes some data and it reads it after that, it's going to see the, the latest data or an error. Availability means that when you do read and write, you're going to have your answer reasonably quickly or, or an error, but you're going to get something. And partition tolerance, uh, this one is, <laughs> is tricky. <laughs> But that means that the system is going to keep working uh, no matter what happened with your network. Um, so you, you can't have both. You, you can't have the three of them. That's what the cap theorem is about. And uh, I'm just going to go here. With Cassandra, 
essentially you're going to to favor what's called consistency and availability. So you're going to favor my bad partition tolerance and um, availability, but you can tune between having a system which is highly available or having a system which is highly consistent. Uh, this little bar, you can put it completely to the left or completely to the right with Cassandra, which is kind of cool. And you can keep it in the middle, which means that you have some good availability and you have some good consistency. Now, the word that you see here, all, quorum, any, and one, those are keywords uh, on the way you define uh, your request. And uh, if we have time, we will cover that a bit later. So um, important questions. When should you use uh, Apache Cassandra uh, for, you know, um, yeah? Yeah, uh, we have had uh, a few questions. So I'll probably uh, reward them and give you a bit of break. So, so, so that everybody knows what all the questions uh, some of the uh, attendees have come across. <coughs> so, Indra asked, in which case NoSQL is better than the relational database? So, basically, NoSQL is better where you want very fast performance for very large amount of data. And sorry, the question is, uh, in which case NoSQL is not better than the relational database? So, it's it's very easy. Whatever jobs you can perform with your relational databases with a limited amount of data and with limited amount of scalability, just stick with uh, relational databases. Also, NoSQL databases do not uh, offer any, uh, as, as Christoph have already covered, it doesn't have any kind of joints, relational integrity constraints. So if you are, uh, your uh, model or your application is going to use those features, then uh, NoSQL is, is probably not for you to answer that question. Uh, Sergio has asked, what is our experience with strong time series data? Uh, in their previous company, they used Cassandra, but moved to Apache Druid uh, as time series, uh, and they handle some uh, features like native uh, resampling in time, time zone conversion, and real time and batch ingestion. So, Basically, Cassandra the, deals with time series data very, very uh, good. Cassandra is it, one of the best use cases of Cassandra is for time series data and for uh, one good example is Internet of Things sort of data. So, but uh, some of the features you have listed are not natively there, there in Cassandra. Basically, where you need to write your data very fast and also have reasonably uh, fast read access, Cassandra is very good for you. And it can work very good with uh, time series data as well. But all the NoSQL database technologies have their own pros and cons. So you need to basically evaluate the technology very well before going for a specific use case uh, so that you can take full advantage of that particular technology. So that, that there might be a comparison between Druid and Cassandra uh, for handling time series data. Uh, I hope I haven't heard that one. Uh, then uh, the next question was, since we do not have joins, what should be taken into consideration while creating data model? So it's a very good question. So basically, you need to uh, answer what all select queries I'm going to perform on this particular table data. And you need to denormalize your data. This is. that your each query is exactly answered by all the attributes present in, in a particular partition. And then uh, from, from that, you can derive your data model, basically. So that was the third and I think the last question. Yeah, so yeah, that's it. Uh, over to you, Christoph. Yeah, thank you very much, Anup. Um... So yeah, so Cassandra is, is, is a very good choice when you need a very high level of uptime and availability. Uh, and that's why you, you have those large companies that use it. Uh, it's very cool technology when you want to replicate your data across different data centers. Uh, and many global companies, Netflix, for example, you will have multiple Cassandra data centers, one in different regions. 
uh, to make sure that the customers have very low latency because we are all very impatient those days. And Cassandra will automatically, out of the box, uh, well, probably that you configure it correctly, will replicate the data across your different data center. Cassandra is fantastic at uh, ingestions. Ingestion, um, data ingestion is very cheap. Um, and the read performance are also very good. But it depends on your data model, obviously. It depends of, of a few things. If you do everything correctly, you can have very good read performance. If you do some mistakes, uh, not so much. <laughs> but that's why we, we are here to help. Um, so I think that's probably answered a little bit the questions uh, that we had. If you, if you want to have a lot of analytics capacity, then Cassandra is not the best choice. Uh, and I guess same for data warehousing. For data warehousing or data lake, you want to store a very, very large amount of data that you might use at some point um, in a very ad hoc manner. In Cassandra, you can't really be ad hoc. You need to know what you want to do uh, before you do your data model. And uh, if you want to store a very large volume of data without doing the reads, then it's going to be expensive for not much reasons. So you have better systems. Uh, yeah, so I guess same stuff here. Um, Real-time analytics, you, you can't do that with Cassandra. And if you have some strong acid requirements, you, you can do that. So, um, the, and I, you know, that's why sometimes we have customers that wants to migrate away from, let's say, Oracle, for example, um, and we're happy to help. But sometimes we, we have them understand that a portion of the data for a specific um, domain is better suited to, to remain in a small instance of Oracle or SQL or whatever, because they need some flexibility that they can't achieve with Cassandra. And for another portion of the data, it's, it's a perfect fit for Cassandra. And let's store it there. It's going to be uh, faster, cheaper, and, and highly available. So you have to think about it. Uh, typical use case for Cassandra, uh, Internet of Things. Cassandra is, is great from time series. Uh, I haven't had a close look at Apache Druid, so I can't tell you why one is better than the other one, in which case. Um, we do use um, Cassandra for time series at Instacluster Cluster because we, st we store all the metrics monitoring of our customers. Uh, works quite well for us. Um, but again, I haven't compared with Apache Druid, so actually I'm, I'm very curious now. So I think I'll do that next things tomorrow. Um, so Cassandra provides very good support for slice with uh, queries, which is good. Then we have uh, the global web application, uh, Netflix, I don't know, plenty of companies like that. Very low latency, replication across data centers across the globe. Uh, that's very important and desirable. You can handle product catalog if you want. Uh, and typically, that's because you have a very clear um, scalability here. You add more products, you're going to scale quite easily by adding more nodes. Uh, those are just some examples. Um, I don't have a slide here. But again, Cathedral is used across different industries, uh, travel, travel agencies. Uh, advertisement agencies, banks, financial services, retail, uh, IoT, uh, and, and more. Like it's, it's, it's widely used. So, um, what to remember from this presentation? A while ago, you will have a database in a single server. Uh, you can't really go very big. With no SQL system, you have different solutions that can provide distributed system and, and more data storage. Cassandra was, was born at Facebook <laughs> and get open sourced. It's sort of a key value store, which is kind of a distributed hash map if you want. Uh, with Cassandra, you shouldn't be shy to denormalize your data model. And the first time you, you touch it, it might be a bit of a shock. But you should be prepared to denormalize, to duplicate your data, to be able to query it in different ways. And if we have time today, we will understand why. 
uh, Cassandra prioritize uh, availability and uh, partition tolerance from the CAF theorem. But again, you can tune between uh, availability and consistency. And uh, Cassandra is great for write heavy workloads. So that's it for this slide deck. Uh, Anoop, do you think I keep going with the next one? Uh, yeah, uh, we in the meantime, we had a few more questions. So I'll probably go through that uh, first. Yeah. So one question was in, OK, that one was covered. So how about uh, uh, online analytical processing? So if there, if there is no join, then how can we write analytics query in Cassandra? So I don't think analytics is a strong suit for Cassandra. And if you do need to join join your data, you need to do it in, in application logic. For example, Spark Spark uh, sort of uh, application can, can read a lot of data and then join. Uh, to answer that, another one was, was uh, is, is should you go for OLTP environment? Uh, if Should you go for Cassandra in OLTP environment if the data is less? So if, if the data is less and if it is manageable by uh, relational databases or any other solutions, perfectly fine. Uh, it depends on your uh, requirement and scalability and reliability requirements. If those are full, fulfilled by traditional systems, you can keep keep using those. But generally, sometimes OLTP systems start to generate a lots and lots of data. So you can think of Cassandra in those kind of scenarios. And the last one was uh, explaining CAP theorem again. CAP theorem, basically, I'll, I'll try to explain that. I provided a link as well. Uh, basically, the consistency, availability, and partition tolerance are three pillars of any distributed system. You can choose to have uh, two of them very strongly. And you can uh, choose to sacrifice the third one. Uh, and, and you can not you can never choose all, all of them all three of them to be uh, very strong all the time in any distributed system. So th that is CAP theorem. It's very, uh, I, I could say, uh, it's not very easy to understand it, it in that manner. You need to see a diagram or, or uh, probably get some hands on to, to understand that. Yeah, that, that's it. Uh, you can continue to stop. Thank you so much, Arup. Great explanations. Um, so I will uh, just handpick a bunch of slides that I think are interesting for you guys. Uh, when it's time for me to stop, uh, Anoop just tell me to stop. <laughs> but uh, let, let's start with a quick overview of a Cassandra cluster. Uh, a Cassandra cluster is composed of one or more data center, uh, which can be in, in the same physical data center, or maybe different geolocations. Uh, each data center is, is consisted of racks, and this is a logical concept. Uh, and then in each rack, you have a bunch of nodes. So data center and racks are logical concepts in Cassandra, but of course, you're going to map that against some physical entity. And that's what happened, obviously, if you do that in your own uh, data center. That's what you have access to. You, you will have a cluster. You will have a single data center, maybe, uh, in a building. And then you have a bunch of racks. And in each rack, you will uh, provision a bunch of Cassandra nodes. And the idea, of course, of, of racks is that if a rack has a failure, a power failure of an, or a network failure, you have those three nodes that are down. And by being rack aware, Cassandra is going to intelligently place the data to be able to sustain a single rack failure uh, quite nicely. If you are in the cloud, for example, here we are on AWS, uh, you might map your Cassandra data center to an AWS data center. So one in the East Coast, one in the West Coast in the US. And then you might decide to map your rack uh, uh, against the availability zone, which are some data center if you want, but very close to each other, but very uh, independent in terms of power uh, and network. And then you have your nodes. So that's the ideal configuration of Cassandra. 
that's actually what we do, of course, for our customers uh, at Insta Cluster because that provides you the highest level of avail availability. So if you, if you are distributed, if your application is distributed, you might have multiple, let's say, AWS regions that you're going to use uh, in, in APAC, in Europe, in, uh, in, the, in America. And then you have your multiple Cassandra data center and your user are going to connect to the microservices or to the application next to it, which is going to connect to Cassandra next to it, saving you a lot of latency, obviously. <coughs> With Cassandra, you can also define some data placement. So you will be able to define some tables or let's say key space, which is a group of table. You can define them to be replicated only on a given data center. Uh, which is very handy if you want to, to be compliant uh, with some data um, um, uh, constraints for, for GDPR, for example. So you can say that all your data for European customers will, will, will stay in, Euro in Europe. Now, we talk a bit about analytics, and it's true that with Cassandra out of the box, you can't do analytics, you can't do joins. Um, you might write your own application to do some client-side analytics, uh, or you can actually leverage Spark, which has a very good, very good connector with Cassandra. And what happened in this data center DC2 is that we have a, a Spark worker on each of the Cassandra node. Uh, somewhere you have a Spark master, obviously. <laughs> and then Spark is going to distribute the load on each of the nodes uh, in a way that Spark is uh, ideally going to query only the local nodes and then do the joins over the network, obviously. So in this case, we have two data centers for, for the same cluster. Data is getting replicated automatically uh, in the background. This one serves your OLTP uh, type of request. This one serves your OLAP type of request. And what happens is that if, you, if, you, if your request is just too uh, resource intensive, and if your data center number two starts to collapse with very bad latency, it will not affect data center number one. So that's what can happen sometime and that's what some customers are doing. Um, I mentioned earlier that you can tune the consistency and the availability with Cassandra. And to achieve that, you need to balance two key concepts, which are the replication factor. It's very simple. We're going to see that. And the consistency level. Replication factor, it's very simple. It just tells you how many times each piece of data is going to be duplicated. Here we have a table. Uh, we had what I call a bunch of data, but let's call it partitions because they are partitions. We have um, the red partition for Alice, the blue for Bob, and the green for Charlie. And you can see that we have a replication factor of three in this data center and one in this data center. So overall, replication factor of four across the cluster, but it's really three plus one. So you can choose that, uh, you, any number that you want. Um, you define that at the key space level which means that all the tables that belong to the key space are going to inherit of the same value, obviously. <coughs> What's cool is that if Cassandra is rack aware, which is a case here, you see that uh, each piece of data, each partition is on a different rack. So you don't have a red and, and another red on this node. Uh, it, it has to be on a separate rack in priority. And that makes it uh, much more available because if this rack is down because of power failure, you still have two pieces of your data. Two replica of your partition, to be exact, uh, are still available. <coughs> so I said there are really two levers um, to tune your consistency and your availability. The, the first one is replication factor. And most of the time, 95% of the time, it's going to be three. Sometimes it's five. Uh, if you don't care about your data, you can pick one or two. 
uh, but most of the time it's going to be three. And the second level is the consistency level. The consistency level, it's a bit different. It's a setting that you set at the client or the driver level. Uh, you can set it for each of your queries, each of your writes or each of your read requests. You can decide of the consistency level. Uh, well, usually you, you might use the same one all the time. Um, but again, it's not a database property, it's a client property. And <coughs> you have a bunch of consistency level you can choose. Uh, all, quorum, uh, one, two, three, serial, any. And the one that is most of the time being used is quorum. And quorum means strict majority. So let's try to define a bit more uh, what it means essentially. Um, if you choose a query at quorum, it means that when your clients send a request, let's say a write request, you want a strict majority of nodes to acknowledge the successful write. If you pick all, it's very simple. It means that you want all the replica to, ac to successfully acknowledge the write. So let's take all. Let's say I'm going to write the partition Alice. Um, Alice is in red. You're the client. You send the right request to the cluster. You will have to wait that four nodes acknowledge the successful write. And then the client gets the successful acknowledgement. OK? Uh, if you do that at quorum across a cluster, it means that you want a strict majority uh, across four. And a strict majority of four is three. So you want three replica, uh, maybe this one, maybe this one, and maybe this one, but any three that acknowledge the successful writes. And same for the reads, except for the reads, uh, they compare the read essentially to make sure that uh, they're consistent. So as you can imagine, if you use consistency level all, and if you have this node, which is down, when you try to write Alice, it's going to fail. You're going to get an error. Bob is fine. Charlie is fine. Uh, maybe David is on, on this node again. I don't know. Uh, but if, if the node is down, if one of the replica is down, then you get a failure. If you were to use Quorum instead, and if this node is down, that's fine. You still have a strict majority of nodes, one to three uh, out of four, uh, which, which is good. If you have this data center, which is completely down, same story. As long as all those nodes are up, you can still read and write at Quorum. Now, if you have uh, this data center, which is down, and, and this rack, which is down, OK, so you only have the two first racks up and running. And you cannot write and read at Chrome anymore. But you can still at consistency level of one, or, or even two, for that matter. So you start to see that you have some um, consistency level which has very low, one, two. And then you have some consistency level which are higher, uh, old, or, or maybe Chrome. I think, in fact, quorum is more of a balance. And depending on the consistency level you want to achieve within your nodes and the availability level you want to achieve for your application, you might pick one of those levels. Uh, and I have to tell you again, 95% of the time is going to be quorum or maybe each quorum, which is kind of similar, but or maybe local quorum. So yeah, I mean, local quorum is similar except it's only against a given data center that you want Quorum. <coughs> so I hope that's, that's a bit clear. It, it can be a bit uh, easy or complex to, to grasp the first time. I hope I make a good uh, introduction here. Uh, I'm going to maybe skip. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In, 
rest of time actually we can uh, continue with the sandra for few more minutes uh that five minutes okay i'm just going to go here in these slides um if you have a replication factor of three okay and your data is, is, is on the red disk this one this one and this one if you read and if you write at quorum so let's say you, you you're going to write here at quorum and read here at quorum you know that by design one of the nodes has to be involved in a read and a write request because Cassandra is going to pick different replica for the request maybe it's just a bit random sometime but by design there is an intersection and that guarantees you that you have strong consistency essentially by opposition here if, if you read and write uh well actually it's all at one so I'll just keep that Yeah, so I think, just let me check. Is there anything else I can quickly explain? No, I think I think I need more time to explain anything else new. So I will stop here, Anoop. Yep. That's fine with you. Uh, there were a few questions. I'll quickly go through them. And then we head uh, to uh, Kafka. Yeah. So ETL processing, is it possible with Cassandra? So yeah, definitely possible, but as Cassandra is a data store, you can just use it for extracting data. It, it, it won't help you process any data. Uh, there was an excellent question regarding, uh, can you delete data from Cassandra and how will it support GDPR requirement to delete all relevant data upon custom request? So because Cassandra is a distributed system, uh, you can, when you issue a delete request, it will delete data, but internally the data will be there for some more time so that the request is uh, propagated and, and all the data is represented as immutable in immutable form. So the data will eventually go away, but once you issue a delete request, uh, the data will not be selected again if you uh, issue a select on that. So. I'm not exactly sure what how, how stick the GDPR uh, and how, how does that work, but I think we have a few customers who are using like storing GDPR data on Cassandra. And of course, if you design it well, if your data model is such that you create one table for each customer, and when a customer requires you to delete the data, you can simply drop the table, uh, then the data is immediately gone. You know? So that, there are workarounds for that and uh, it can definitely delete data, but it, it is a bit tricky and you need to optimize it correctly to handle that. And yeah, I think that's it. Uh, 